over time, the, the role of local transit providers have evolved, but specifically for each of you, your transit systems um, were really created and developed in order to address or um, a specific issue or solve a problem. And that has changed and evolved over time perhaps, perhaps not. So if you could speak to what that initial impetus was for creating a, a transit agency and do those reasons still exist or have they changed? I'll, I'll kick things off. I think um, as was mentioned <coughs> earlier, our system in Pasadena was created initially as a single uh, circulator just to get people uh, around in the commercial core area in anticipation of a large event. Um, and it, it grew over time to uh, become really the primary first mile, last mile um, option for folks here in the city. And it's, you know, to be affordable, reliable, as frequent as we can afford. And uh, it's been interesting to see how it's evolved uh, so tremendously, and I think it really speaks to um, the the need for a, a diverse set of mobility options. And I think that really was a primary driver for us. Um, I'll weigh a little bit on Glendale. We have a, a very similar start um, to Pasadena being a local transit system. We started with a downtown circulator. We've always had traffic on Brand Boulevard because all roads lead to Brand and Broadway. Um, and so it was um, the first shuttle that we had was really developed as kind of a traffic mitigator, but also an economic development tool, um, trying to move people in that downtown corridor um, out of single um, occupancy vehicles. Um, but the system grew um, very gradually over time to be more of a neighborhood connector. Um, so the, when a, the transit system was first envisioned, it was really parochial. It was, what, how do we move our people in, in our little downtown area? And they never really considered how we connect people to the regional systems for those longer trips and, and that interconnectivity to the region. And that really didn't happen until Metrolink came into play in the 90s. We started in 1984. Uh, so by the 90s, Metrolink was up and running. And so we were trying to do feeder service to get people off the trains into the downtown core um, or into some of our um, employment corridors. Um, and it, it just morphed over time, very slowly, but morphed over time, taking the different communities, the neighborhoods in our community, and connecting them together, whether it was to the college um, or to the downtown employment centers. Um, so it was very gradual growth, and, and I think only in the last probably 10 years have they really looked at us being that first last mile, the connector um, to those regional services. Great. And Corinne, can you talk a little bit about for LEDOT, because you started really kind of with a couple of commuter lines. Exactly. And has that changed? Yes. Um, we actually um, started as an agency when the then RTD, which is now Metro, um, was about to cancel some commuter express lines. And because it was going to affect the residents of the city of LA, um, the city of Los Angeles Department of Transportation stepped in and took over those lines, which, by the way, we still operate right now. And so that was our start. Later, they also gave us a line in downtown for a downtown circulator, which was called the Dash B. And subsequently, it was divided into, became two routes, Dash A and B. And many of you may be familiar with the Dash um, uh, service because it's pretty ubiquitous across the city. Um, Dash really stands for downtown area short hop. And because it started in downtown, and we actually did a contest, and that was the winner of the contest that um, actually named that service um, Dash. So because it was so popular, we actually started to, um, to, to uh, translate that success into the communities and started with the Dash Fairfax. Um, as of today, we have 32 Dash routes uh, throughout the city of LA and soon to be 38 because we were um, recently um, given authority by the city council mayor to expand our, 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 our services. So we'll be, um, we will have 38 dash routes in, by next year and 16 commuter, commuter, commuter express routes. We started with 11. And we also have a paratransit um, discretionary program that supplements access services, which is quite popular. That's for senior and disabled. So we have grown um, in spurts, I would say, 
gradually at, in the beginning, and then we accelerated in the early 20, uh, 2000s, and we added in one year, I remember adding as, as many as nine dash routes. So we really kind of realized that this was a very popular, important um, uh, mode of transportation within the communities, and also as a first mile, last mile, um, to regional bus and rail. So it has grown in, as I said, spurts. Yeah. Given um, those, especially kind of the, the perception that transit is for other people, um, Valerie, how do you think we can kind of overcome that a little bit and, and demonstrate that transit is accessible for everyone and can be kind of the choice? I think for, uh, especially for local operators, um, I mean, communication is key. Uh, getting the word out there to people um, it, from all different um, sectors of the community um, and in terms of marketing, personal communication, events, and, and it's any, for us, any way we've been able to uh, educate people about our system, get them comfortable with it, um, introduce them to it, we've used. and. We also leverage the opportunities to coordinate with our other agencies. Um, Metro, in particular, has been fantastic about uh, bringing on local operators in, in terms of marketing and uh, making it more free, uh, affordable, um, which has been a really a, a great tool for us. And just really is, I mean, we're limited in our staffing. So um, it's that sort of human capital of and passion, frankly, people who are committed to transit, um, to to go that extra mile to um, spend a little bit more time, whether it's uh, that day or over the weekend, um, and you know, just getting the word out. And then also for us as a local operator that's not directly operated, so we contract our services. Um, first, uh, our contractor, who is a number of them are here today, thank you. It's the, the drivers, the bus operators serve as ambassadors. People answering the phone serve as ambassadors. I think it's keeping up that relationship um, and it, because it really is a relationship. It's not some, we don't approach it so much as a business as we do, it's a community service. So try to get out. So the other point that Catherine, you raised in terms of um, you know, misperceptions is the availabil availability of funding that local transit operators have. Um, to any one of uh, you that would like to answer, to speak to a little bit of kind of the creativity um, that goes into being able to provide, um, you know, safe, reliable, clean service um, with limited funding and then still be able to grow and expand your, your service. Um, with for DOT, um, we were able to use our property dollars for transit, which uh, even though the definition has expanded in recent um, years, um, we still have that funding source. But because our service um, area is so large and because we have so many buses and so many uh, communities to serve, we have to be creative. And so what we have done is that for our capital um, equipment purchase, we use um, grants. We go after grants very aggressively. We have 5307 um, capital, which we use as a, as a base, at least as a match. But we are very aggressive in going after grants. So um, we have been, for the last at least 10 years, we have not used any of our operating property dollars mm -hmm. to buy capital. So that is one way that you can be able to leverage your, 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 the, the limited resources that you have to be able to um, acquire things that you need to, do, to, to have, buses of course, um, in order to be able to expand service. It's a very challenging situation, even though I, I, I'm not saying it as, it sounds very easy but if I say it in that way, but there's a lot of um, hard work that goes in to be able to go after um, extra monies that are available at the federal and state and local levels so that we can use that, those to leverage our limited local dollars. And oftentimes you have um, you're not the only agency pursuing those grant exactly dollars, and they're right. limited, right. right? So, Valerie, I know um, your team has been very successful in securing a number of grants. Um, how, what has Pasadena, Pasadena Transit done to position itself in order to be able to, to pursue those, those grants? We, good question. We, um, 
We've worked very hard at that. Um, we're pretty relentless. We're relentless. We are relentless in looking for additional streams of revenue and going after those grant opportunities. We pay very close attention when we get guidance from our uh, friends at Metro on uh, what makes up a good grant application, and um, that I think has uh, been a really key ingredient and really just keeping a beat on what's happening with the operation and um, being uh, very uh, transparent about that. So in the last few years, technology has really changed things for public transit. Um, technology continues to develop and be refined and um, as public agencies, our procurement processes aren't always quite as nimble um, in order to be able to keep up with changing technologies. Um, Corinne, how has your agency been able to integrate technology and attempt to keep up considering it's changing so rapidly? That is a, a very um, important point because um, what we have been finding um, that as you adopt a new technology and because we have so many buses, let's say, if you want to look at technology from a bus point of view, by the time you get through the first the, the cycle, the technology has changed. And in addition to which, what we were finding too is that we were buying um, separate pieces of the technology with no plans, for, and there was no integration happening. And what we have done in the last, let's say, five years is that we hired an IT um, company that really, be with, the, with the mandate of making sure that the platform that they were going to install was going to be able to um, integrate any new technology that we had and was be able to grow with that technology because what we are finding like a lot of other small agencies and other agencies as well is that we are constantly buying new, spending lots of money, buying new technology and by the time we have it uh, on our buses or in our operations it was already um, obsolete. So we wanted something that can grow with us and not only grow with us to do what we wanted it to do with like the next bus uh, for instance is a good example but also to have other things that we are purchasing for instance the cameras to be able to talk to that technology. And whether it's um, um, the technology for maybe a mobile shield or whether it's um, Vericity, which, which looks at the, the performance of your engines, we want all of them to be able to be integrated and talk to each other. But in order to do that, we had to make sure that we were intentional in procuring an IT um, company that was understood our vision and the understanding that we would not be able to buy new technology every time something new comes out. Um, Valerie, Catherine, have you guys had similar experiences? We've taken a little bit different approach um, over time. Again, uh, as a smaller agency, there, there isn't a lot of money to redo your capital systems, your technology systems all the time. Um, so we actually invested in individual components over time and have tried to maintain those components. So we have found that um, as I call it the, the guppy syndrome that happens in technology, everybody buys each other out. As those agencies or those companies have um, consolidated and invented kind of the one system does everything for everyone, um, that they have lost the customer service and they have lost the capability of um, the reliability of the, the types of um, equipment and service that they're providing. Um, so we intentionally took us um, a simpler approach and a more long-term approach to buying separate components that don't talk to each other, um, mostly because we could generate a ton more data. We don't have any staff to actually look at that data or do much of anything with it. So we took it from a customer perspective of what's most important to the customer. They want to know the on-time arrival. Um, the, the, what the bus predictions are, we use that same information as a, as a layer in our dispatch system, but it is totally separate from our camera systems and from um, uh, other technologies that are on the buses because it was cheaper for us to maintain that. And we have a system that we bought probably 12 years ago. We have never had a down day with it. Uh, either on the software or the hardware side. And it's like, do not get rid of those units. I mean, we're out there scampering to find more of them because it's been really solid. The nuts and bolts were there and it, it actually functions really well um, for like the next bus um, type of, of purpose. We're, we're right now going out in RFP for camera systems. You know, we just need a basic camera system that captures those images and those events on, on the bus. 
I don't need it to be talking to Mars. Um, you know, I, I just need to be able to pull a video or download a video that documents whatever that incident is. Um, I, you know, I, I don't need to know necessarily speed of the bus or whatever else was happening. Was it a rainy day? Uh, it, I, I just need to know, did we capture that incident on camera and can we get to it and make it usable? Um, so for us, that's been more of an economics driven decision, um, but also a reliability um, decision. If we put everything in one basket and that basket falls apart, uh, we're doomed because we don't have, we're not big enough and have the money enough to come in and say, okay, wholesale, we can just trade everything out right now on these. Okay. So um, for kind of on the heels of, of, of that, of kind of once you make a commitment um, with a certain technology, it's, you know, somewhat more difficult for a smaller agency to then be able to kind of shift gears. Um, so keeping that in mind, um, in December of 2018, the California Air Resources Board approved the Innovative Clean Transit Regulation, which sets a statewide goal for public transit agencies to transition to 100% zero emission bus fleets by 2040. Um, you have a much more aggressive goal. <laughs> so how, how, does, how has fuel technology um, kind of affected your agencies in the past? And given this mandate, um, what are some considerations and how do you go about um, implementing that? Well, LADOT currently um, that has four separate bus yards in the different parts of the city. And we have four different types of fuel right now. Um, we have gasoline, propane, CNG, and four electric buses. And all of that equipment, that, that capital that has been in play, now suddenly we have to pivot, and rather quickly for us. Um, we are talking about eight years, which is an extremely short time. Um, it's one thing to be able to buy buses, and again, there are some challenges there because Electric buses cost more than or the, the types of uh, buses we currently operate, number one. Number two, the technology is not quite there yet in terms of battery and in terms of even the smaller power transit vehicles, for instance, there's not an Altoona tested vehicle as yet. Um, so we have to be able to change out all of our buses by 2028. Um, since 2018, two years ago, we stopped buying mostly uh, any other type of uh, fuel type knowing that we have to, as I said, pivot to um, being able to implement the policies that our uh, mayor and council has adopted. And so the challenges I've seen besides the cost of the vehicles um, for us, um, there are two, three big things I would say very quickly. One of it is the time. Um, to be able to do that uh, at the same time, not only are we um, replacing our existing fleet of the three different types that I mentioned, but we are also expanding. Uh, we, in 2018, we have been given a mandate to increase our bus fleet by another 150 buses. So by 2021, 22, we should be having 520 buses, all of which should be electric. And of course, the, in the infrastructure, which is a, the much more challenging part of it, as we are finding out, is far more um, difficult to accomplish because it's not within your own control. You have to work with your utilities, you have to work with your different departments that actually do the infrastructure work. And of course, the huge unknown at this point is the cost of doing that, of the, the electrical infrastructure that we don't have um, a, a good handle on right now. But we are working through those issues um, slowly. We are fortunately having um, lots of help from our partners like DWP, as I mentioned. And one other thing I want to mention, I think it's unique to DOT, because we, um, we contract out all of our services, the, the model that we've had so far was that the contractor was going to find their own facility to be able to operate and maintain the vehicles. Given the fact that we have to put in all of this very expensive um, infrastructure, we now had to turn, to, uh, the first thing to do was to purchase those, those yards. And so in the last three years, we spent maybe $100 million buying three of our four facilities and are in the process of buying the fourth facility. But unless you have a yard, you can't even start to do some of the work that you need to do. And then what we are also finding is that not only do you have a yard, but the yards are, were built for CNG buses and in terms of space. And given the infrastructure and equipment that you need to put into the yards, we are running out of space as well. So we do have some challenges. Uh, but I, again, that's a mandate and we are working through all of them. Catherine, can you speak to that a bit? 
All right, Corinne's being very gracious and really understating <laughs> the challenge that LA DOT is, <laughs> is going through. And I say that because we work very collaboratively, yes. uh, all of our local agencies, and, and LA DOT has really um, led the area um, in the whole electric bus technology. We have a kind of an area consortium that meets uh, very frequently to learn about what it takes to actually make that electric bus transition. And we have um, under um, LA DOT's leadership uh, and, and the great staff that you have working um, with you, Corinne, uh, we worked uh, to have the state um, Department of General Services look at bidding out electric bus equipment, buses and chargers and those kinds of things, so that those of us agencies that don't have that capacity will in the future have an ability to look at a competitive purchase and hopefully an economical enough purchase to be able to transition to those um, uh, to those types of um, vehicles and, and the charging systems. Uh, we are lucky because we in, we're finishing our facility now. We've built in a little bit of infrastructure for a transition to, um, to a, an electric fleet. Um, but we, we just invested a ton of money and land into building a CNG station um, that's been open now for 10 years. Um, our fleet was the first fleet in LA County to be 100% CNG. So we kind of skipped some of the hybrid technology and went from uh, as an early transitioner to CNG. It was a huge transition for our staff, um, for the mechanics, um, learning how those buses run so much hotter and what was happening in the engines to be able to accommodate that. Um, so we had bus design issues um, early on in, the, in the, that transition, but also learning issues with our the staff, our contractors are doing that, and then the you know just getting getting the fuel to our buses. Um, we started out with um, SoCal Gas decided, oh, we're going to run a little gas station for you, <laughs> and so they bought this equipment from Italy, which they had no way to repair. So after we transitioned. <laughs> You know, for two years into the CNG world, they were, they said, oh, we're not, we're shutting it down. We're not going to do anything anymore. You can go to L.A. to fuel. <laughs> um, so for years, we transitioned. We went to Burbank and we went to um, downtown Los Angeles to fuel our buses. Um, so we're talking about, you know, what economic impact is that to, to, for your system? Um, so we did invest in, in our own um, public station, um, trying to again think a little bit more globally. Let's let's see what we can do to help our community to make that transition to cleaner fuels. Um, but now we're looking at a, another technology change, and I don't think we've recouped our investment yet out of that CNG um, equipment and service for that station. And now we're going to try and invent something else that that isn't mature. And and I think. The larger agencies are, are struggling now with, okay, we have a mandate to do 5% of our purchases on these electric vehicles, but there's, there's no tested technology. We're still trying to figure out how to connect pieces of wire to make sure that the systems on the engines can talk to each other um, and that you can actually fuel between different places. So it's it, for, for our local systems um, that are, are smaller than LA DOT, we're really trying to sit back and um, take in and learn as much as we can from the other agencies because of the cost to do that transition and the the limited resources to be able to actually implement it on a on a day to day. Um, and so I do have to thank Pasadena. Um, <laughs> they were the lead in a, in soliciting a grant for us. We heard from LA DOT through our consortium that um, that uh, Caltrans had a planning grant. Um, so we went together with Pasadena Burbank and uh, Glendale to apply for a sustainability study to look at doing that transition. Um, and so that is something different that the locals do. We work really cooperatively together um, and, and to share those resources. And I think that's why we've all been very successful yeah. in trying to, trying to adopt to those transitions. So you queued up my next question perfectly. So Valerie, talk a little bit about the study and as a smaller agency, why it's so important to leverage resources and kind of work collaboratively with other agencies. Well, I think uh, Catherine tapped right into that. It, um, because we're so constrained um, mm -hmm. with funding, with space, with our ability, with emerging technology, we don't have any, there's no slack in the line for us to experiment. Um, so the collaboration with the disability study, for example, was a way to, um, you know, really approach this in a, in a uh, thoughtful 
as thoughtful a way as we could in terms of how what, what we need to get ready for, um, how we can implement this in a way that is um, is cost efficient as possible um, and effective. We we actually are in a different situation with our facility, so we're uh, currently working to um, solidify a location for a, a, a one that the city would own, and so that's a big factor for us. Um, so, um, as you were saying, you know, you you need to have the facility in order to to implement the zero emission um, fleet. So, I don't know if that answers your question, Good. but. And as as they were sharing, I felt my you know heart like tightening, and <laughs> and because I will say, well, there is one thing that um, as we're learning more about the zero emission technology, um, electric buses in particular, one thing that we know to be very cognizant of, and we're hoping to, I don't know, uh, I've, I think the feasibility study will help um, sort of uh, shed some light on this. Uh, but we've been doing a lot of research on this and staying, you know, LEDOT has been. Um, critical um, big element in terms of uh, bringing all the operators in the region together on a quarterly basis so we can learn about what's happening because and what we're hearing is that it's not just the capital impact it's the operations and how do we because the technology as it's improving we're hoping that that will it will come down but as it stands right now you need a uh, more buses out there. Uh, you need a higher spare ratio in vehicles. Maybe we'll have to get traded out uh, sooner than you would want during the course of the day. If you have a particularly long route, um, and so that increases your operations. So that's an important thing to keep in mind as we're planning this. It's not. I mean, the facility is a big deal. Buying the buses, which you mentioned, are, are much more expensive. Dealing with the infrastructure um, and how that will work, but also it's the operations. And we have 20 years to figure it out. It seems like a long time, but it's not. Um, so I'm going to shift gears a little bit from strictly kind of the operations and funding um, conversation to really about how we serve our customers. Um, as we saw in the video, a lot of what local transit providers um, provide is kind of this relationship building and trust and familiarity with who our customers are and the areas that we serve. Um, so we had Meghna Khanna who presented her study findings focused on women travel patterns um, and how oftentimes either we're not measuring how women are traveling or we're, we're not being as adept as we can be about really addressing um, kind of what our female customers need from, from our services. Um, how can we as transit providers really meet not just um, kind of the, the needs of our female customers, but really kind of our more vulnerable populations, be the, the elderly or our children who sometimes use our service. How can we make them, um, as local transit providers, are we uniquely positioned to be able to be more responsive to those needs? Or what are some of the challenges? And they weren't expecting this question, so. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I think it's um, interesting and useful sometimes to have a long-term perspective because I've been here over 25 years as well. So you, were, you literally saw the evolution um, of these types of concerns. And I thought the study that Metro did was very helpful. Um, we also collect that information. It's one thing to collect the information, not only to use it. And I think we all have information that we don't do anything about. So this is uh, impetus for the, for the rest of the agencies for the information that they have to be more proactive in looking at our vulnerable population. Now, one of the things the LADOT has done recently is that we have a pilot that we started, which we are going to expand across, across the board, um, is that we have solar power signs. And um, so at bus stops, there is actually um, a sign that tells you, which is, which is just put on top of the bus stop, so it's very um, inexpensive to, to um, purchase and install, that tells you when the next bus is going to arrive. And then what we found out recently, too, is that we can put an audio bu button in for those who, 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 are, uh, who obviously need to hear the, the, the bus arrival rather than to see it. And, so, and then we also put in a brighter light so that even though it's a very small, tiny action, all of these are helping vulnerable populations to be able to um, ride transit when maybe in other circumstances they couldn't. And based on the feedback we have received, it's clearly helpful. Um, people are saying, you know what, what a great idea, the fact that you actually have an audio button that I can press and I can hear when the next bus comes. 
And one other thing I wanted to point out, I think was also important, um, and I didn't hear it mentioned, but I think one thing that when people are waiting on buses, especially uh, women, um, that you want to know when the bus is going to come. Um, it's very important to have some kind of real-time bus information because you can plan your trip better. And when you can plan your trip better, it means that you don't have to go and stand at a bus stop and wait for 30 minutes for the next bus to show up. You know exactly when you can actually go to that bus stop. So I think information is also important for people to have, to be able to make decisions concerning where and when, and, and they'll be able to wait at the bus stop safely. So we, we again, have, agree on the, the next bus or, or the bus arrival information um, that's key. We, we actually took some of the results of our early surveys, um, similar to what Metro did, because uh, we had the same stroller issue, um, stroller or cart for shopping. Um, and so probably the last three bus orders that we've done, we um, adjusted our seating and have a um, kind of not in the front uh, dis uh, area for uh, people with disabilities, but in the next row of seats um, facing forward, we did flip up seats so that you could actually wouldn't have to take apart your stroller or whatever, you could just flip the seat up, you could sit next to the stroller, the stroller's um, confined because of the, the forward-facing panel. Um, but we, we said, you know, without doing a lot of extra costs, we can accommodate other people's needs um, and a variety of people's needs um, based on what they were bringing onto the bus. Um, so that for us, that was a really simple change in our, in our bus ordering. Uh, but it's had a profound effect in, in letting people be comfortable with hauling, you know, the, we're, we're lucky enough we're not standing room only for our buses, so we, we do have some ability to maneuver on board the bus when we do that. Um, but it, yeah, it didn't cost us any more money to, to think a little bit differently. Yeah, I would say it is a sort of fine-tuning um, things that don't have to cost a lot, just it's, it's thoughtful planning and implementation whether it's at the bus stop, those amenities, consideration of what can we do. Sometimes that can get a little bit uh, more involved when you're talking about lighting and things, but we, um, and or just as we're purchasing our next bus, how the seat configuration, how that can be um, considered. And also I think it's really staying in touch with what's going on with the community and whether it's uh, doing surveys or talking with uh, customers directly on the bus or on the phone, talking with our bus operators, trying to keep a pulse uh, of the of the activity and concerns. So in a minute, I'm going to go ahead and open it up to for any questions that you all might have. So while you're thinking of your questions, I have one more for um, the panelists. Um, Transportation has traditionally been thought of as a, a male-dominated world, and I think um, more specifically transit operations, um, I think that applies more so. But yet we're starting to see more women rise in positions of leadership in, in transportation. Um, why do each of you think that transit or transportation planning and operations is really aligns for, for leadership and why women should be, get more involved. Whoever wants to speak it first. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I think, uh, let me start with, with an illustration from my own personal experience. When I started uh, working in transit, um, it was, and probably still is, very male dominated, and um, you know, that's mm -hmm. the way it was. And as I watched from the, from the time I started to now, the, the difference even in our, a contractor's staffing has reflected that change. And we are seeing so many more women now as general managers and leaders um, taking over the job that was predominantly male. And that to me is a, is a success story in itself. And the very fact that I am as the first woman as a bureau chief as well, is saying that there's, there's an there's a understanding that women has have a um, not an advantage, I'm not going to say anything to the, my male um, the audience, but they do have an understanding of things that would affect riders, especially since m many of them are female, um, that you would not normally would consider. Um, small little things that you would not think about, like the shoulders, the fact that women are the ones who are caretakers and, um, of their families as well as um, their, their parents or uh, elderly in the, in the community. How do they travel? So that sensitivity is what I think helps us as women in leadership 
to be able to make far more practical, realistic um, decisions that help our ridership in a way that I think sometimes because men are not as big as user of public transportation as, as females are, I think that in itself lends a, 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 a nuance that, that is helpful. And I think too, there's something about people in general who are attracted to the transit industry, public transportation in particular, um, that lends uh, perhaps um, is more open to that happening. Um, I, a lot of uh, our uh, male friends here in the audience and uh, counterparts that we work with daily are, you know, just just as much as the females, you know, very uh, passionate, committed to doing a good job, committed to providing good customer service. It's those personality traits, being able to be a multitasker and um, at the same time um, have balance that with, with compassion and remembering what's what's key. Um, I will. I, I think. It's interesting for me, in my 25 years in public transportation or in transportation planning and then operations here for 17 years, um, most of my um, bosses have been women. Uh, my predecessor, who we have a lot to thank for for passing transit, is here. Um, Ms. Kathy Cole, our general manager uh, for dealing with our general operations day to day, uh, is here, Leti Ochoa. Um, so, and I think it just speaks to the field in general and, and sort of um, what we do and why we do it. And maybe it's just, it's naturally a better fit for it to be more inclusive. And so Catherine, what advice would you offer to a young um, female transportation professional and kind of getting into this industry? I would um, encourage them to be strategic thinkers and problem solvers. Um, I, I think there, there is an advantage sometimes to, to, to being women. I think we actually process information a little bit differently. Uh, and I, I think we're, we're much more practical in how we uh, analyze and approach um, some of our problem solving solutions. Um, and I, because nobody goes to school for transit 101 or however, you know, <laughs> it, it's take those skills and abilities that you've gained over time through your experiences or through your education and reapply them. Um, I have a degree in biology and people say, well, how did how, you make that leap <laughs> to a transit system? And I say, well, it's all structure and function. We, you know, we learned that with photosynthesis or, you know, Krebs cycles or everything else. And, and our transit system is a living organism. So it's, you know, it's about people and moving people. So if you can take those natural skills that you have and that ability to process information and to be strategic with how you apply that, um, it, 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 anyone, male or female, could be very successful in the, in the field. Um, but I, I would encourage, you know, um, young people that come into the field to say, you have talents, use those and apply them, apply them well. And, and don't get stuck in a box and think a little bit outside of the box, but think about what that value is, that the work that you do on a day-to-day -day basis, you know, what, what effect that has. I, I always tell them, it's like, I could have gone into business and made widgets. And would I have found that to be satisfying? And I say, no, because there's this whole social justice component that's really important to me. And I know that what I do now on a day-to-day -day basis has a positive effect on somebody's life out there. And we may not hear that every day, but once in a while I get the call from a passenger or we get a note or a comment card that comes in that says, this is why we do what we do. Great. So with that, I'd like to open it up for, um, to the audience. Any questions that you might have? And we have a couple of mics. If not, I have more questions. I'm happy to sit up here and chat the whole day. Yes, thank you for your uh, presentation. Um, I didn't hear anything about the use of bicycles and its interaction with the transit systems and whether that's becoming more of a thing, less of a thing, and how that's working out. That's uh, the first question. Then leap forward maybe eight years, and we're are the plans or what are your projected ideas about the Olympics? Well, so the first part well. was bicycles right. and kind of um, their interaction with transit mm -hmm. and or kind of 
I imagine a little bit as a first last smile and what that relationship looks like. Mm -hmm. So if we could answer that one. Well, one of the things LADAT has, has done and recognized, mm -hmm. partly because we also have a bike share program within the city of LA, uh, we did a couple of things. We made it mandatory for us to have bike racks in all of our buses. And so that was to facilitate people who were using the bikes to get to transit an opportunity to be able to have their bikes to, to continue their trip after the end of their transit ride. So that was to accommodate and recognize really that there is several modes of, 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 of ways people want to move around. So the, um, the other thing we have started to do in our dash buses is our smaller 30 foot. We allow folding bikes under our buses, which was something that we didn't do before. So we are trying to look at it as an ecosystem, not just buses, but the fact that there are different types of modes that we want to accommodate as well. And then in terms of the interaction on the street, um, clearly that is important as well. We want to make sure that our drivers are sensitive to the fact that you have bikes riding in, in areas that are not bike lanes. So we have done additional training with our staff. We have bought what we call technology to allow the drivers to, to recognize or be alerted in the bus when there is a bike or a pedestrian in their blind spot. So we have made some proactive choices in, in ensuring that we can um, complement um, bikes, whether it's on the buses themselves or whether they are users in the street that we are both sharing the street at the same time. And the, should I answer the second part of the question? Sure. Uh, what was the second part? Um, <laughs> eight years uh, for, the, for the Olympics, what do you kind of see the role of uh, public transit in that? I think we first of all need to expand our definition of transit. We want to make sure that we're not, all, not only talking about buses and bikes and um, cars. We want to, um, well not cars of course, trains. But we want to make sure that there are different types of modes that have evolved over the last several years. We have scooters, we have, um, of course, we have all the TNCs. We want to see how the, the entire system can work together rather than against each other to be able to give choices to people who are going to be here um, in hundreds of thousands in, in eight years. So integration, um, first mile, last mile, ensuring that a trip could be done uh, without um, fair issues, meaning that there's a, a standard fare across the board. All of those things are um, goals that the city is working towards. Seamless fare payment system, seamless integration of different modes of transportation, so that in 28, uh, 2028, there is going to be uh, lots of people who may be speaking different languages coming into our city, but should have no problem be able to get from point A to point B. Valerie, early on you talked a lot, and I think all of you actually touched upon the the relationship between the local transit providers and Metro and kind of both seeking guidance and direction, but also needing to um, provide kind of complementary service. So if you could talk a little bit more about that and how the local transit role really is different from the regional transit provider role. So we, and, and one thing I neglected to mention earlier is our system was evolving. The gold line stations were a huge factor in that. So our system is actually designed around serving the gold line stations. And then we also connect with um, numerous regional uh, bus routes that come into the city, LEDOT, uh, a commuter express route, Metro, of course, and Foothill Transit. And we actually even have a point where Glendale and Pasadena. Yeah. So we have a one yeah. joint stop. Yeah. <laughs> Um, and I think, but what, so we are designed around, um, you know, providing the, the pure community transit and then also feeding into the regional network. And so we're very concerned with those shorter trips and getting people to um, be able to get out to the region, but then also to easily get to where they want to go within the community, schools, parks, uh, medical destinations, shopping, dining, you know, what have you. Um, we are probably a little bit, I, I don't know if agile is the right word um, in terms of our sort of more short-term planning, uh, but we are able to, uh, we are a little bit more nimble, I think, um, because uh, the scale of our operations is so different than Metro, to make little changes here and there to, if somebody calls and says, hey, you know, this one connection is just, it's just really not working out. I'm, um, if you could, you know, adjust your schedule just uh, by a hair, you know, and uh, we, we, we can look at that and we can maybe make that change um, uh, a little bit faster. 
Um, although the difficulty for us is because our funding is so limited, it really kind of depends on that request. Sometimes we can, sometimes we just can't because it might involve actually bringing an additional bus, which we can't do. But we are very personal, our service is personal. Um, as I mentioned earlier, you know, the, the bus operators, not only are they ambassadors, but I think over 70% of them live in Pasadena, so they are actually part of the community. Most of our staff lives in Pasadena uh, or in the immediate area, so it, it feels different. So before um, I wrap up, just want to check if there are any questions out in the audience. I know as a local provider, you uh, provide the first and last mile on a lot of your trips. Uh, I'd like to know your thoughts on uh, microtransit and how it affects the local provider. <laughs> who, wants to, who wants to jump in? Uh, I think um, hmm. the there are gaps in some of the service that we can, that trans providers can provide. Um, I see a real potential beneficial role if microtransit can fill that gap. Um, I'm, as some people in the audience may know, I am. I have a lot of, give a lot of thought to bus zones and how those are used. Right now we have a lot of intrusion by the Federal Express guy, by the TNCs, et cetera. So I think it's important for interagency coordination as these programs move forward to make sure that doesn't add to the complication, but that there's good planning put in place to make sure it's safe and accessible for all services and for smooth operations. But there definitely, I think there is a gap out there. We can't be everywhere. Um, at all times, so I think there's times of day where transit service is not available or is a lot less frequent. Um, in the lower density residential areas, there tends to be a lot less service, but still need to bring people into, uh, whether it's connecting with the regional transit network or getting into other places. So I'd like to, to further that just a little bit because I, I think there's going to be a challenge because um, I think Valerie's right. There are going to be segments of our community that, that are underserved or by geographical circumstance, if they're in a canyon or up a hillside, um, they're going to have less access to bus service. Um, but right now, the way that microtransit's being structured, it's as a commercial enterprise or as a business. So it has to, there, it's really being designed um, for the most part, to pay for itself or to be economically sustainable, which means it forces the microtransit to be in the same geographical corridors that your established bus systems are. Um, so there's um, there's a potential for poaching, I guess, uh, from the uh, rather than encouraging people to get on the bus and to to make that shared trip, um, to to again having more vehicles on the street in an already tight corridor. Um, so if, if the microtransit isn't funded to the point or subsidized to the point that the bus system is, then the same people that are stuck in the canyons or in the lesser served, lesser dense areas, they're going to still not have any access, even though microtransit would be the perfect solution to be an on-demand response type of service for the fewer trips that would come out of the canyon versus another layer on top of in in what some areas are is a very successful, very dense um, area. So for us in Glendale, an, another 10 vehicles at Brandon Broadway doesn't really help us any. because We're trying to get rid of those vehicles, get more people onto a, a larger shared ride vehicle. Um, but we have canyons that we can't serve with a bus that, that would be perfect for a dial -a ride or a micro transit program. And, and a, for those of us that have been around forever, microtransit is the same as dial -a ride uh, It's just it's not necessarily for elderly and disabled. It is really just a flexible on-demand service. It's been around for eons, um, but it's how we deploy, how we have the potential to deploy that. So it comes at the the key is going to be how microtransit is funded in our area, and if the funding will allow to serve the underserved. Otherwise, it's just more stuff. Any other questions out there? Okay, so I think anniversaries are very much like birthdays where I like to take a moment and kind of think back on 
how, how good or not so good the previous year was and how to make the coming year better. So I'm going to ask each of our panelists to think, um, you know, on Pasadena Transit's 25th anniversary, to think ahead um, and where you see transit in the next 10 to 15 years, either realistically or unrealistically. I think ex exciting times are ahead for us, and I think we probably need to prepare ourselves and the, the industry because I can see in the next 10 to 15 years um, that we have most of our fleet being autonomous. I know that's maybe controversial, and some people may not think mm -hmm. it's that close, but I think we have to prepare for the time when we have an autonomous bus fleet that is um, zero emission and that's demand response at the same time. And um, we have to think about what implication that means to the workforce. We have to start thinking about it now, not then, when it happens. Um, I, I would imagine that we would have payment systems in 10 to 15 years that maybe no payment system, maybe it's all free, we don't know. We're heading in that direction, potentially. Um, but if we do have to pay, maybe there's, you don't, you can do, like what Amazon is doing now, you can, once you walk in the bus, it recognizes you and deduct that money from your account. I think it's going. It's, <laughs> I mean, there's a lot happening in, in right now in different industries, and I think it's a matter of time before those technologies are tra uh, transferred to the transit world. And I think we are more than due for that type of exciting, innovative, um, mind-altering types of changes that can, can that can happen. And I don't think it's as far away as we 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 would imagine. I think in 10, 15 years, we'll see a very different scenario and landscape um, in terms of transit agencies. Valerie Kaplan? Uh, you know, I think uh, Corinne's absolutely right. The, the, the pace at which some of this technology is um, emerging is pretty phenomenal, especially when you look at autonomous technology and um, which there, there steps are being made along the way that we're not even really that aware of that's going to make autonomous vehicles a real thing. Um, but before then, before we get to that point, um, I think one of the things I'll be really interested to see how it evolves is curbside management and knowing that there is all this demand these days at the curb space, whether it's parking or e-commerce or the delivery folks or transit, um, whether it's a, a, PNC type of transit, microtransit buses, um, and making sure um, I think we're so much more informed now in terms of when we make these decisions to make sure things are accessible and equitable and safe. Um, but it's making sure all that comes into play. And I'm curious to see what it will look like in 25 years. So I, maybe we'll just all, you know, just sit from our home and not have to go out. I don't know. <laughs> because they'll know automatically what we're thinking you are. doing. Somehow yeah. they'll take your money. Yes. We've kind of alluded to artificial intelligence. Um, I find it really fascinating, but I also find it really scary. <laughs> Going back to the books we used to read in school, and like, you know, Big Brother's watching us. But, but it, it, I look ahead to what we, I think the passengers are going to expect from us, and how that that customer expectation is has really ramped up. It's really morphed a lot the last few years. But it's it's like getting on board with your payment system. The bus is going to be able to say, "Hey, Catherine, how are you?" Before you even left the house, Siri's going to talk to you and say, "You're taking the bus this morning." You know, the bus is going to be here and you know walk out to the corner at whatever time that is. You know, and, and you're, you're paying mm -hmm. by. It's like mm -hmm. it, you don't have to think anymore. I mean, the the systems could be in place that just kind of shepherd you through your day. I, I don't know how good that is for us as a culture, as a civilization, but um, but I, I think you know our our customer, our clientele is is going to be looking at you know how how do I do things if it's all electronic? How do you use that artificial intelligence to be intelligent in in the way we move? Um, and 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 where do, where do you draw the line? Um, you know, with with how much how much does this bus know about me? Um, and you know the privacy issues, or whatever else. It, it it just opens up this whole wide world of whoa, this is really exciting because we could do all this connectivity. 
Yeah, everyone will know everywhere I went, <laughs> you know, good or bad. They do know now. Well, probably. And, and just thinking about that, it reminds me how because it's, because that technology makes it tends to make us more isolated from humans. Um, that before we get to that point, how grateful for, we are for the bus operators, people who on a daily basis are making that personal contact with individual. Um, it's something they're, they know, they're used to seeing them every Monday, Wednesday, Friday at 7 a.m. when they get on Route 20, you know. It makes a difference in their day, and I think that, that quality, of, that concerns me, because I don't know what will replace that quality of life, um, that um, key personal human-to-human -human element. I, I hope we find a way to retain that somehow, because um, we hear from our customers, and I know you guys do too, that, you know, it, it matters. That connection really matters. Great. Well, I want to thank our panelists this morning and helping us celebrate Pasadena Transit's 25th anniversary and really providing some um, insightful thoughts about where our local transit providers have been and where we might be. Um, so thank you very much.